Okay, welcome to International Polar Bear Day. My name is BJ Kirschhofer. I work for Polar Bears International, and I'm joined with uh, Megan Owen here of San Diego Zoo's Concert Center for... San Diego Zoo Institute for Conservation Research. Ah, man, it's a long title. <laughs> it is a long title. Yeah, I typed it out. But uh, anyways, uh, so Megan, where are we right now? So we actually just landed today in Long European uh, Svalbard, which is a, a protectorate of, of, Nor of Norway. It's governed by Norway. And we're incredibly excited to be here. We're starting our third year of maternal bedding studies here in Long European um, in Svalbard. And um, we're uh, just getting set up here and, and uh, ready to get into the field in the next couple of days. Yeah, so um, like Megan said, we just arrived today, like hours ago, and that's why the broadcast is just a little late. Um, yeah. We literally just unpacked our bags uh, here in this town, and we're pretty far north, aren't we? Yeah, and we're at 78 degrees north latitude, which is as far north as I've ever been. So this is the high Arctic, and it's an incredibly beautiful locale. And historically, it's an area where polar bears have denned in relatively high density, and it's an incredibly beautiful Arctic landscape. It is pretty spectacular, and if you can believe it, uh, we're here at the end of February right now, and the town of Longyearbyen has not received direct sunlight yet since uh, last November. That's amazing. It's really incredible. I'm from Southern California, so the idea of not having sunlight for that length of time is truly hard to comprehend. It's pretty wild. So they had uh, darkness, I think, until about mid-February. Mm -hmm. And, and then once the start, sun starts returning, it, it, it comes back at a pretty fast rate. Mm -hmm. um, the first few days are gaining something, I think it's almost like 45 minutes a day yeah. of daylight. And right. right about now we're gaining about 20 minutes a day. Um, but when I say they haven't received direct rays, so you can kind of see in the, in the sky, it looks light. But, uh, but there's so many mountains around. This is a very mountainous place. We'll show some pictures here in a minute that the, the, the sun actually hasn't hit the town yet. So yeah, yeah. that's coming up here in early March mm -hmm. and uh, the town has a little celebration. Uh, yeah, apparently. if you can imagine not having any sunlight for a length of time in the winter time and then that extended period of no direct light, how happy you would be to see the sun come over that horizon. So we're lucky because this is when we start our work here and it's, it's actually quite nice. We get a, a good deal of light during the day and it's spectacularly beautiful. A couple of years ago, uh, at the end of this trip, when we were working, I had the great opportunity to go skiing with a couple of students here that had spent the dark season here in Longyearbyen. And uh, we climbed one of the mountains near town here, and of course, uh, they had not seen direct sunlight yet. And as we got to the top of the mountain, they were they were jumping <laughs> to get their face in the sunlight. They were so excited to see the sunset. That is really, really cool. Yeah, it was pretty neat. It was a neat experience to see other people so happy. Yeah. Uh, Life in the high Arctic. Yeah. Totally, totally different. <laughs> totally different. Yeah. So, uh, so Megan, what are we doing here? Well, so we are uh, extending previous work that's been done that has focused on uh, studying the timing of maternal, emer maternal den emergence. So polar bear mothers, when, uh, when they're pregnant, they'll dig a den uh, in, in the snow uh, in the fall or later in the early winter. And that's where they'll stay until they give birth to their litter of cubs. And this is one to three cubs, um, on average about just shy of two for the population-wide average. And um, when they come out, you know, this is the first time they've seen daylight, they've seen the outdoors in several months. And so we're, we're studying uh, the timing of that emergence, the behavior of mother and cub at emergence. We're wanting to get a better sense of how developed cubs are when they come out of the den, how, what their body condition looks like. And we're doing that uh, in a really non-invasive manner. So we're working with some cameras that uh, BJ here has designed and he's used in different locales around the Arctic. And while we're here, we actually go near these dens, but not too close because our primary goal is not to disrupt polar bear moms and their, and their young newborn cubs. And we put these cameras out and then we leave. And then months later, uh, our collaborators will uh, retrieve those cameras and we'll download the data and we'll start to decode the information that's contained in them. And we're learning a lot about polar bears. Yeah, so if you can kind of squint maybe and look towards the center of your screen there, you're going to see kind of a yellow blob. 
And this is video that was captured uh, last year mm -hmm. with the camera systems that we're using. And again, the, the camera, the, the view is pretty small. Yeah. But, and this and this is because we, we don't want to be a disturbance at the den site. So we put the cameras a bit away. But but the video, although maybe not great for uh, maybe for film or right. it's not going to be the next blockbuster polar bear hit. Uh, <laughs> but it is good enough for science. We can tell generally what's going on there in the frame. Can't yeah. We? I mean, it's really nice, actually, because, of course, as BJ just mentioned, we really like beautiful imagery. And that's a really important part of, of sharing polar bear science with the world. But we can get data from this type of video. So just knowing that the female has peeked her head out of the den, that's information that we can use. And then we can distinctly tell, even at that distance, whether it's just the mom or it's a mom and one or maybe two cubs. And, and this, this information uh, is really valuable to us, and we're definitely willing to, to trade off video quality for leaving mom alone. Yeah, so the video that we're watching here, we're about 600 meters away um, with a camera system, uh, which is, you know, that's pretty far. That's pretty far. Uh, yeah. It was, you know, you needed binoculars in order to kind of see what was going on at that distance. And, yeah. it, and she was denned pretty high up in the side of a mountain, wasn't she? Yeah, she was denned quite high up. And we it was really a challenge for us in terms of placing our camera. And we were not 100% sure that when we put the camera out that we had uh, targeted her den uh, close enough to make sure we captured that image. But as it turned out, uh, we, we did. And we got some really nice centered imagery and some great data from that. It was really exciting. Yeah, so we try to get out there before she even comes out of the mm -hmm. den. Mm -hmm. um, and we're able to do this because of uh, some neat technology, and, and that's kind of a focus with a lot of new uh, uh, polar bear research, yeah. uh, uh, but with radio collars, right? Yeah, absolutely. So technology is the key to our furthering our understanding of what's going on with polar bears and, and a wide range of habitats actually around the world. And as you know, conservation biologists, our goals are to learn about wildlife and to be as non-invasive as possible. We really don't want to disrupt the animals we study. Not only do we not want to compromise the welfare of the animals we study, but we don't want to change their behavior. We want to understand natural behavior. So technology is really helping us go further and to leave a lighter footprint. And that mm. is really exciting as a conservation biologist Yeah, to be a part of that. So we have these bears that we're studying, they have radio collars on that are put on by the Norwegian mm -hmm. Polar Institute, also mm -hmm. another partner in on this project. Right. And, uh, and because of all these radio collar locations, we're able to hone in exactly, right. basically exactly where these polar bears are. Yeah. Uh, we get, you know, sometimes uh, tens or maybe twenties of locations mm -hmm. um, from this uh, radio collar. We can average those locations and say, well, most likely she's right here in the snowpack. And, Right. And that's what we're able to do here. We were able to ski right to the destination and, and put our glasses, our, our uh, binoculars up and, and see a chunk of snow that she had pushed out, which is, yeah. which is pretty remarkable. It was pretty remarkable. And, and as you know, as we're looking at the videotape that we've collected at this den site and other den sites, we you know, wait with great anticipation for that first image of the, the polar bear mom to come out of the den. But occasionally we're fooled by a reindeer. Mm -hmm. or other wildlife that passes by our lens. So we get this really neat snapshot of, of what's going on, you know, in this incredibly beautiful and remote corner of the world. Yeah. It's really, really cool. It is cool. Now, these dens are pretty camouflaged, aren't they? They're incredibly hard to find. And when we go out there as a team, we definitely confer with one another because we might have an idea that, you know, this is where the den is. But we definitely ask each other and the others that work with us whether they agree with that assessment. And we, you know, we don't want to leave really until we have a good sense of where the den is. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to, to tell. Yeah, it is. And once we place a camera, you know, we can't move it. So we, nope. <laughs> we aim it, and we hope we have it, and then we go home. Yeah. And we have to wait. Yeah, we have to wait. And our, our partners are collaborating here of the Norwegian Polar Institute. They go back in the early spring and they retrieve the cameras and the hard drives that are associated with those cameras. And then we, you know, wait with great anticipation to be able to look through that data and see what happens. Yeah, so uh, last year we had one den we were able to get to. Mm -hmm. This year we have four yeah. here in the, in the greater Svalbard area, which yeah. is pretty neat. That's, that's a lot of dens for this type of project. It's very exciting. I mean, we work really hard to get these data. And at the end of the day, it has to be a long-term commitment 
uh, a project like this because we're not getting a lot of data necessarily each of these years that we come out. And there's just a lot of sort of luck. I don't know if that's the right word, but it, we have no control at the end of the day how many dens we're going to be able to monitor. So this year with four potential dens to monitor, we're incredibly excited. Yeah, it's going to be good. So, be good. so we're in a pretty cool place too. Um, if we want to talk a little bit about mm -hmm. where we are, um, we are working with the Norwegian Polar Institute and uh, they work with uh, Eunice. Mm -hmm here in Longyearbyen, and mm -hmm. there's a pretty fantastic facility not far from where we're broadcasting from here, right. which is really kind of a researcher's dream, Arctic it researcher's is. dream facility. I mean, it is a, it's a beautiful, modern yeah. building um, with all of the warehousing. Mm -hmm. uh, all the support. All the support, places to fix your gear, store snowmobiles, store uh, Arctic gear, mm -hmm. uh, efficiently check it out, go yeah. use it. It's really nice, actually, after, you know, working in the Arctic, is it's not something you do casually. Being out in the field here requires a tremendous amount of preparation and a tremendous amount of expertise in terms of how to uh, stay safe and, and um, make sure you're not taking unnecessary risks. So gear is a big part of, of making sure you stay safe and warm while you're out in the Arctic. And uh, everything... Uh, is best pulled together if it's organized well in advance. And so working here at, at Eunice in the Norwegian Polar Institute's uh, facilities here, we're really benefiting from an incredibly well-organized operation. And that really helps us do what we're trying to do. Yeah, it makes life pretty easy. It makes, yeah, it's quite nice. Other places that uh, I think both Megan and I have worked, uh, it is so difficult to get anything done. Yeah. Most of what you're doing, you're either trying to stay alive um, <laughs> or you're just trying to get your stuff there or whatever. It yeah. is so time consuming. And to be able to just uh, fly to a place like this and literally get on a snowmobile and get out and do your work is, is pretty neat. It's pretty exciting. And, and the idea that this is also a training ground for students, mm -hmm. that excites me a lot. So they have a, a program here where university students can come from other parts from Norway and I believe from other parts of the world and they can learn uh, a range of sciences that are devoted to Arctic researches, research. So it's not just the biological sciences, it's, the, it's climate science, it's, it's uh, geophysical sciences, all of these expertise coming together under one roof dedicated to the Arctic. So it's really inspiring. Yeah, it's a pretty neat place, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so, you know, I think as we kind of think about wrapping up here, um, you know, there's been some kind of wacky stuff going on here yeah. uh, the last several <laughs> years. Um, you know, we've had uh, an increase in avalanches mm -hmm. in the area here, which has been pretty wild. Some yeah. buildings that have sat here in town since the 70s or earlier mm -hmm. um, from the early mining days. They've mm -hmm. been affected by heavy snow loads right. or avalanches coming sliding down. So there's some changes potentially happening here in town. And, and today it was raining. Yeah, today it was raining. At yeah. 78 north. Yeah, so today, February 27th, 78 degrees north, and we landed in Longyear to, to rain. And it, you know this is something that has happened before, certainly, um, but it is happening more frequently uh, from the, the best data that we have. And so it was my first time to, to be in the Arctic this time of year and to walk under rain. And, and I didn't pack my umbrella, and I was regretting it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty terrifying just getting around town. You know, all those <laughs> snow piles have melted into uh, small rivers. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I think tonight it will get cold again. Mm -hmm. uh, looks like the temperature is going to drop and yeah. all that stuff is going to freeze right. hard as a rock. Right. So life will be pretty interesting around yeah. here. Yeah, it's pretty much fairly challenging getting around here under the best conditions, but uh, tomorrow will be interesting when all that rain freezes up for sure. Yeah. Interesting times. Yeah, for sure. So stay tuned here uh, on Polar Bears International's website. Um, we'll uh, also be posting some blog posts over the next 10 days as yeah. we uh, conduct our work. Yeah. Um, we'll try to fire some pictures out as well mm -hmm. um, and let you know how things go. So yeah. thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, happy International Polar Bear Day. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll chat with you all soon. Bye.